All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the 10th installment in the SAR Speaking Out About History series. I'm Brooks Lyles, the Historian General of the National Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. We are excited to have Major General Jason Q. Bohm, United States Marine Corps, with us today. Jason, an infantryman by trade, has served for more than 30 years and has commanded at every level from platoon commander to commanding general during both peacetime and war. He has served in several key staff positions, including as a strategic planner with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Director of the Marine Corps Expeditionary Warfare School, House Director of the Marine Corps Office of Legislative Affairs, U.S. House of Representatives, and Chief of Staff of the U.S. Naval Striking and Support Forces, NATO. He's received a bachelor's degree in marketing, a master's degree in military studies, and a master's degree in national security studies. Jason has written several articles for the Marine Corps Gazette and won various writing awards from the Marine Corps Association. His first book was From the Cold War to ISIL, One Marine's Journey, and Washington's Marines, The Origins of the Corps and American Revolution, 1775 to 1777, is his second book. I'm particularly excited about today's interview as I first met and got to know Jason at the reenactment of the Battle of Princeton and the SAR's Princeton and Aston Pink Creek wreath laying ceremonies back in January. He was there, along with other legacy unit representatives from the Army, National Guard, and the British Army. Uh, and he was representing the United States Marine Corps and those Continental and State Marines who fought at the battles of Princeton and Aston Pink Creek. I'm honored to present Jason Bohm, who will give an overview of this great book and then answer questions submitted by you, the members of the National Society, the Sons of the American Revolution. Jason, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Brooks, and uh, thanks so much for not only your service as a soldier, but for helping to keep our education of our great uh, nation alive today. Absolutely critical, and as we approach the 250th year, I can't think of a better time to talk about not only the origins of the Marine Corps, but really the origins of our uh, our great country as well. So thank you for having me. Well, Washington's Marines is really uh, a labor of love for me because it allowed me to combine two things that I'm really passionate about. First, the Marine Corps, having served over uh, 33 years as a Marine, uh, you know, history and tradition is extremely important to the Marine Corps. Uh, we instill it in our Marines from the first day they, as we say, step on the yellow footprints at boot camp or across the line at Officer Cannon School, because we know that establishing that very strong bond to the legacy of Marines from our past is a force multiplier on the battlefields today, because Marines refuse to let their fellow Marines, their forefathers down and four sisters down who went before us and sacrificed for our great country. And the other half of that is really, as I started studying more about the history of the origins of the Corps, you can't get away from understanding the context that existed that created the Marine Corps, the necessity for a Marine Corps, which really began uh, with the birth of our nation. And then I would add also uh, the Continental Army and the Continental Navy uh, side by side as uh, all of our paths really intertwined in those opening years of the revolution. Well, thank you. Um, we're going to jump in the first question. Uh, when I retired from the Army, I went to work as a defense contractor, and I was a red team guy. The guy who hired me to come work for him was D.L. Combs. He's a retired Marine colonel. He's an old 8th uh, eighth, uh, eighth Regiment guy. Uh, several of the questions in here are from, from Daryl, um, who is a member of the Kansas Society. Did the Marines ever serve with or under Glover's Regiment of Hard-Ass Seamen? Yeah, well, well, it is true. Glover and his Marblehead Sailors uh, were some badasses. So uh, just for context, for, uh, for those who may not understand, uh, once Lexington and Concord happened, uh, John Glover led his uh, militiamen from Marblehead and surrounding uh, coastal towns in Massachusetts to join the militia forces, the Minutemen that were holding the British under siege uh, outside of Boston. Uh, they were there uh, from the very beginning. They were there when uh, George Washington was named commander in chief. Uh, 
and the Continental Army was stood up and they would eventually go from being militiamen to being designated as the 14th Massachusetts Continentals. Uh, Glover and his Marblehead uh, seafarers uh, really did great service for the nation and for the Continental uh, forces early on in the war. Uh, to start with, uh, as the, the, uh, the Continental Army was holding the British under siege in Boston, the Continental Navy had not yet been established. Uh, so the Continental Army held the British under siege and blocked any access for reinforcements or resupplies from the landward side, but the British had total control of the seas. And so they could uh, be plentifully resupplied and reinforced uh, via the sea lines of communication. Washington understood this shortfall, so he determined to fill the gap by establishing his own private navy, uh, utilizing soldiers initially to serve as Marines and as sailors. And it was John Glover who had a background as owning a fishing fleet that provided Washington with his first ship, which was named the Hannah in, uh, in regards to uh, John Glover's wife. And uh, he also used some of his sailor, uh, excuse me, some of his soldiers to serve in the role of sailors and Marines in those early years. And then many people know the story about how uh, Glover and his Marblehead men were critical in the battle for Long Island and helping the Continental Army to escape across the East River uh, following the defeats on Long Island in the Battle of Brooklyn Heights. If it was not for them getting the army across the East River, uh, throughout the night, uh, the Continental Army may have ceased to exist, and therefore the American Revolution could have ended right there in 1776. And then finally, many people are very familiar with the famous crossing of the Delaware River. And this is where John Glover and his men uh, once again manned the boats during some very rough conditions in the middle of a blizzard to get Washington's main effort army across the Delaware River. And to the colonel's question more directly, this is the only time where the Continental Marines and John Glover's force may have overlapped. They never served directly together, but as Glover and his men were crossing Washington's main effort at McConkie's Ferry, nine miles north of Trenton, uh, John Callwalder of the uh, Pennsylvania militia known as the Associators was working with the Continental Marines about 22 miles down river. And they were a support in the effort to block any British, re as you were, Hessian reinforcements uh, from coming to aid Johann Rahl, who was gonna be under attack by Washington. So they certainly stopped some of the same ground, uh, but they didn't work directly together. But there is one more interesting piece of history here that links the two. And that is that after the first Battle of Trent was complete, Robert Morris, who was a Pennsylvania congressman and one of three congressmen who was left in Philadelphia as the Congress uh, withdrew to Baltimore to a more safe location, Morris wanted to get the Continental ships that were operating on the Delaware River out to sea to prevent their capture. So he wrote to Washington and asked for the Marines who had been detached from the Navy and attached to the Army uh, to help fight uh, this first protracted land campaign in support of George Washington. He asked for them to be returned to the ships to man the ships so they could put to sea. Samuel Nicholas, our first and senior officer, balked at the idea of doing that because they were currently engaged with operations ashore. He did create a company of Marines, uh, pulling some from each of his uh, subordinate companies from his battalion and sent them back to uh, Philadelphia to assist. But Washington used this as an, as an opportunity in which John Glover and his marble men, their enlistments were terminating after the first Battle of Trenton. And many of them wanted to go home and operate as privateers, which was a form, far more lucrative opportunity for them. So Washington recommended to Robert Morris that the 14th Massachusetts or remnants of them and Glover's Marblehead fishermen 
uh, could actually operate those ships and sail them down the Delaware River and up back to New York, and that would be their quickest way in getting home. Yeah, very cool. Um, I'm going to branch. I'm going to take an opportunity here uh, to ask you to expand on something I learned in the book. Um, there were two kinds of Marines during the Revolution. We we had state Marines, and we had Continental Marines. Could you explain a little bit about that? Sure, and I would argue there are actually four types of Marines. Uh, the first type is what I mentioned. I'll call them soldier Marines. Both George Washington and Benedict Arnold up in the Battle of Alcor Island, uh, up upstate New York on Lake Champlain, both employed soldiers as Marines. And there are some great quotes from both of those generals talking about how the Marines were the refuse of the regiments and they were terrible and uh, mutineers and uh, did not do very well in the eyes of both of those army generals. So soldier Marines first and foremost. Secondly, were privateer Marines, as I mentioned, uh, private citizens that were privateers, which in essence were sanctioned pirates to be able to capture British ships to prevent their resupply and reinforcement getting to British forces operating in the North American continent. So you had several of them who were serving in Marine roles. And in fact, some of them uh, would operate ashore during the 10 crucial days fighting as Marines. And one of those gentlemen was a 27 year old merchant from Philadelphia named William Shippen, who would go from being a privateer on the ship Hancock operating in the Pennsylvania State Navy's flagship, Montgomery, and then went ashore and fought as part of the 2nd Battalion of the Associated Brigade, which was the militia from Philadelphia, which operated side by side with the Continental Marines. And that's important to understand because uh, William Shippen was killed in the Battle of Princeton. And so we want to give credit to the privateer Marines. And then you have the two main uh, Marine forces that you mentioned. Uh, many of the states, because the Continental Forces had not been fully uh, manned or fully equipped, created their own state militias, state navies, and state marines. For example, one of those was a gentleman named Thomas Forrest, who would uh, serve as a Pennsylvania state marine and would eventually transition to work for the Continental Artillery and was one of the key artillery batteries that was firing down King Street on Trenton during the Battle of Trenton as Alexander Hamilton was firing down Queen Street side by side. So he was a Pennsylvania State Marine who went on to do great things as a soldier in the Artillery Corps as well. And then you had your traditional Continental Marines. And what makes them the National Marines is the fact that it was a resolution by Congress, a law that created the Continental Marines under Samuel Edmonds. All right, excellent. Um, you mentioned his name there uh, in the the explanations uh, or the answers to the questions about uh, Glover. But the next question, also from uh, from Colonel Combs, who was the senior Marine during the Revolution? Yeah, the senior Marine during the Revolution was a gentleman named Samuel Nick. And Samuel Nicholas was the first commissioned Marine officer, which made him the senior Marine, which also made him the first Marine recruiter. And that will matter here in a moment. Uh, many people point at that as identifying him as being the first commandant of the Marine Corps. But that's actually false because the Congress did not bestow the title of commandant on the Marines until 1798 during the Quasi War, well after the American Revolution. But Samuel Nicholas was a 31-year-old merchant from Philadelphia. He was a Quaker by birth. His father died when he was seven, and he was sent to the Academy of Philadelphia, which became modern-day University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he graduated from there when he was 16, and once he graduated, he became a merchant and the owner of the Conestoga Wagon Tavern in downtown Philadelphia. And that uh, that opportunity presented itself in which he was able to get to know many of the prominent citizens and leaders in Philadelphia, which likely led to him being the first commissioned Marine officer. Okay, so the Conestoga Wagon Tavern, um, 
There's a lot of taverns involved in the founding of the Corps. The ton and we do like our alcohol. <laughs> All right, next, uh, next question is uh, from Jesse McIntyre of the Florida Society. And I'm, I've tweaked a couple of the questions here because they were some sort of somewhat redundant. But um, this question is, in what battles, if any, did Continental Marines and Continental Army Forces conduct joint operations? Well, great question. And uh, I'll start out by saying, uh, Let's define what joint means. And joint means two or more separate services working side by side with each other. And it wasn't until 1986 when the Goldwaters Nichols Act was signed, which basically forced the services to work very closely together in joint environments. And, but the first joint operations actually happened in 1775. And so to answer the question more directly, the Marines participated in four separate battles as part of joint operations during what we'll refer to as uh, the 10 crucial days and then after. Uh, the first one was the Battle of Trenton, which we described here a little bit earlier, in which the Marines served as a supporting element of George Washington's main element attack on Trenton. The Continental Marines were located about 22 miles further down river around an area called Bristol, Pennsylvania. Uh, their mission was to cross over the Delaware into New Jersey with John Call Walters Associators, uh, attack any Hessian forces or British forces that would be found in the area, and basically uh, act as a blocking position to make sure those forces could not reinforce the Hessians in Trent. The second battle was the Battle of Awesome Punk Creek, which you mentioned earlier. So interestingly, on the night uh, of uh, the attack on Trenton, there were four elements of that operation. The main effort led by Washington himself, and then three supporting efforts further down river. And out of all of those, the only one to successfully cross the river on Christmas day was George Washington in the main effort. All the others, uh, because of the severe weather conditions were unable to cross successfully. The Associators and the Marines got about two thirds of their force across, but because the weather was deteriorating and they couldn't land their artillery, they pulled them back over into Pennsylvania. Caldwalder thought that, the, uh, that all the forces to include Washington did not successfully cross until the next morning when he was writing a note to Washington and he hears cannon fire coming from the direction of Trenton. And then they see Hessians fleeing down the river on the other side of the, uh, the river. So they decide uh, we're going to execute our last orders. They successfully cross the river, but unbeknownst to them, as they're crossing into New Jersey, Washington is crossing back into Pennsylvania. Once Callwalder gets that information, he starts to balk. He starts to question whether his mission is still relevant. But the Marines and his other subordinate commanders said, heck no, we're not going back into Pennsylvania. Let's stay on this side of the river. Let's chase Von Donop and uh, the Hessians that are retreating towards Pen uh, Princeton at the time. And they actually convinced Washington to come back across to the New Jersey side, which sets up the Battle of Austin Punk Creek. Washington is consolidates all of the Continental Forces. The Marines are now with Washington and his main body on the south side of Punk Creek on the south side of Trent. Cornwallis with 10,000 soldiers attacked down from Princeton and they are repulsed three times uh, during that first day of battle. The Marines and the Associators were originally on the right flank during that battle. They were pulled in to the main crossing site at Punk Bridge to reinforce the Continentals uh, before they could assault uh, additional times across the river and, and successfully get across. In the middle of that night, those who know their history know that Washington, instead of staying in position, pulled his forces out that evening and marched 11 miles further north to attack the isolated position at Princeton. Uh, the 4th Brigade was supposed to participate in the battle to finally defeat the Continentals. Cornwallis told uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mallhood to come down to Trenton and reinforce, 
And that created a meeting engagement outside of Princeton, which became the Battle of Princeton. I know we're gonna talk more about that in a moment. So I'll move on to the fourth and final battles where the Marines participated in this protracted land campaign was what you mentioned earlier, and that was the Forge Wars. The difference is once the Battle of Princeton was complete and Washington took his forces up into Morristown, Henry Knox no longer had sufficient soldiers to man his cannons due to desertion, disease, casualties, and terminating enlistments. So he looked around the battlefield and he saw this battalion of Marines under Samuel Nicholas. And he says, wait a minute, those Marines know how to operate ship's cannons and shore base cannons are very similar to them. They just have different carriages or a little bit longer. So he requested of General Washington that the Marine Battalion be assigned to the Continental Corps of Artillery, which Washington approved. And for the final battles, uh, these really skirmishes that occurred during the Forge War, the Continental Marines served for approximately four more months as the arm of the Continental Artillery. All right. Yeah, that's uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, Next question is from Cliff Olson of the Missouri Society. Uh, Cliff is uh, wondering why Marines are used to protect the Navy. Were the sailors not trained to protect themselves? Well, that's something we still do today, Cliff. So thanks for the question. You know, so uh, <laughs> interestingly, you know, so all joking aside, uh, sailors and Marines have very distinct missions on the ship. Obviously, the sailors exist to keep that ship running and to fight it as a warship uh, in battle against the adversaries. Uh, the Marines had several roles on board a ship. And generally speaking, Marines were larger in stature uh, than their sail, uh, sailor counterparts. In fact, uh, one of the uh, nicknames for Marines came about during this time, if you heard the term jarheads, uh, that's because there were lanterns hanging from the overheads below decks on the ships. And because the Marines were taller, they were always hitting their heads on the lanterns. So the sailors came to call them jarheads, jars being the lanterns. Uh, but Marines had several responsibilities. First and foremost is they maintained a good order and discipline on ships, making sure that the regulations were being adhered to. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes sailors would mutiny. So the Marines also protected the captain of the ship and the officers from mutinous sailors. Uh, they fought from uh, the ships from the riggings and the top mast of the ships. They would snipe down on enemy crews as the ships went into battle. In fact, today, uh, Marine officers have something called the quadrifoil on the top of our uniform caps which is the symbol that the Continental Marines wore on their cover so that our snipers firing from above could identify Marine officers and not accidentally shoot them, uh, going back all the way to those origins. We would also lob grenades across from the top uh, fighting mass to the opposite ships. We would provide, uh, so, uh, as you were, fighting men to be able to repel the enemy's attacks on our ships. And we would create our own boarding parties to capture enemy ships. In addition to that, Marines are tasked with conducting limited land operations in support of naval campaigns, i.e. landing parties. And then rightfully so, and very wisely, the Continental Congress, when on the 10th of November, 1775, resolved to create two battalions of Marines, they put specific word in, in the law that said Marines can fight on sea and land. And that is the uh, terminology that was used to justify taking the Marines off the ships being constructed in Philadelphia, forming a battalion under Samuel Nicholas, and detaching them from the Navy to go fight under General George Washington during the 10 crucial days and beyond. If I'm not mistaken, the, um, the quality of life on ship was a little better for the Marines than it was the, uh, the naval crew. Uh, and they also got a little better pay, I, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that is, yeah, that is true to some degree. I, I'm sure it would be debatable if you asked them back then, but uh, certainly we know that the the officer in charge of the Marine Detachment was the second highest paid officer on the ship 
behind the captain. I know that the uh, the crews of, of naval ships um, in both the, the British Navy and, and the American Navy at different points, uh, a lot of those were impressed uh, or pressed, which means they were uh, taken off the streets um, by press gangs and you know, they may have been knocked over the head. They may have been uh, induced with alcohol, but they woke up on ship and uh, all of a sudden they were off the coast going somewhere they had never intended to go. So that uh, impressing um, impressment and the requirement for discipline uh, of the crew were both uh, kind of hand in glove Absolutely. And, and again, to protect the captain and the officers when they decide to mutiny. Yep. All right. Next question is from uh, Dave Bassoni, uh, the Florida Society. Uh, is it true that the Gadsden flag was carried aboard our first Commodore ship by the First Continental Marines? That is a true statement. Yes. Uh, so there were actually two flags that were flied on our first Continental uh, ship. In this case, the flagship was named the Alfred. Uh, and interestingly, it was commanded by a guy, a guy named Dudley Sultanstall, who would be the Commodore in 1778 to lead the Penobscot expedition. And I'll talk more about that at the end. Uh, but Essex Hopkins was the first fleet commander, and he had a first lieutenant on board the Alfred named John Paul Jones, which you all are very familiar with. And the Marine detachment commander on that first flagship was Samuel Nicholas. And so the two flags that were flown on the Alfred, the first one was the Grand Union flag, which was the first approved flag of the United Colonies because we had not yet declared independence when the first fleet set sail in January of 1776. And uh, the Grand Union flag, for those who don't know, it had the 13 red and white stripes, but where the blue field would come, it had the, basically the, uh, the Union Jack from uh, Great Britain that was located up, uh, which would eventually be replaced by the blue field and the stars represent the states. So the Grand Union flag was the principal flag for the United Colonies, and that was approved on the 3rd of December, 1775. On the 20th of December, before the fleet set sail, uh, Representative Christopher Gatson from South Carolina actually presented John Paul Jones with a flag of his own design, uh, which was approved by the Congress on the 20th of December. And that is the famous Gatson flag, yellow background with the coiled rattlesnake. And so both of those flags were flown from the Alfred as she set sail and went down to conduct the Navy and Marine Corps' first amphibious operation at New Providence, uh, Bahamas, in which Samuel Nicholas led the landing party. An interesting bit of history there, too, is uh, that operation was successful in the regards that it captured 88 cannons and 15 howitzers, uh, which is actually more than uh, Henry Knox brought from Port Ticonderoga uh, to uh, the siege outside of Boston. It's just that he arrived before the fleet got back up north and with gunpowder provided by Connecticut, uh, Knox was able to take uh, the British under bombardment. And once they got the guns up on Dorchester Heights, that made Boston untenable. And you all know the rest of that story. All right. Next question. Um, back, back to Daryl Combs, what actual role did the Marine contingent play at the Battle of Princeton? Okay, good question, Colonel. And uh, so at this point, uh, once Samuel Nicholas took his uh, battalion that was created by taking three of the ship's detachments, forming them into a battalion, uh, participating in uh, as a support and effort in the Battle of Trenton, and then uh, directly in the Battle of Ossipump Creek, Washington had assigned Samuel Nicholas and the Marine Battalion as an, a separate battalion to work under the Brigade of Associators. So basically under the command of John Caldwalder at the time. Caldwalder's brigade was assigned to General Nathaniel Green's division as they marched the 11 miles north up towards Princeton. 
uh, Green's division was in the lead and their mission was to basically uh, destroy a bridge on the Stony Brook, uh, which would prevent uh, Cornwallis, who still thought Washington and the Continentals were down at Trenton. Uh, it would create a natural barrier for them to come back and reinforce uh, the fight that he expected to have at Princeton. Uh, so they would uh, not only provide that block and position, but then draw the attention from the 4th Brigade that was operating out of Princeton as John Sullivan and his division moved around a hidden road and hit Princeton from the flank. So originally it was supposed to be part of a support and effort to the main effort with George Washington and Sullivan hitting Princeton from the flank. What happened though, as I mentioned earlier, is Lieutenant Colonel Mawhood who is in charge of the 4th Brigade, received orders the night before from Lord Cornwallis to come down to Trenton with two thirds of his force to reinforce them before the final attack to destroy Washington at Trenton. And he was moving out early that morning and had just crossed Stony Creek, uh, Stony Brook rather, when he looked off to the flank and they see these gentlemen moving down this sunken road along the creek. And it became what we refer to as a meet and engagement, where two units meet each other surprisingly and then uh, be, basically uh, go into a battle. And then what happens, it's a, it's a race to see who can gain the key terrain and who can gain fire superiority. And whoever can do those two things will normally win that battle. Well, Hugh Mercer and his brigade uh, is at the lead of Green's division and as this meet and engagement starts, they move out of the low ground and up onto uh, the plain uh, outside of Thomas Clark's uh, home, which still exists and is on the Princeton battlefield today for those who want to visit. Uh, Mawhood turns his forces around and they smash uh, on the battlefield. Unfortunately, uh, Mercer didn't know how large the British force was. Uh, he was greatly outnumbered and Mercer uh, gets basically shot off of his horse and bayoneted several times on the battlefield, and his brigade turns and starts to retreat. Callwalder and Samuel Nicholas with the Marines hear the fighting going on, but they're down in the covered position at this point. Once they hear the battle begin, they move out to join the fight, but right as they crest the high ground and they start to form with the associators on the left and the Marines on the right, as their foreman under fire from the British, Mercer's brigade is in a full retreat, slamming right into their front. Uh, the Marines and the Associators advance. They fire a volley at the British, but there's confusion because of Mercer's brigade retreating, and they start to disintegrate towards the rear. They all fall back about 150 yards, regain uh, control of their forces, Callwalder and Nicholas are in the process of doing that when George Washington shows up on the scene. He had turned his horse around from his uh, movement with Sullivan, comes back over at this decisive moment and tells uh, the, the Marines and the Associators, turn around and counterattack. And he personally leads that by placing himself in between the British and the American forces and basically says, follow me, men. And it works. George Washington's stellar leadership uh, inspires the Marines and the Associators and some Continental soldiers who are now joining the fight. And they basically uh, charge in and overwhelm the British uh, before they can be surrounded. Uh, they break contact and uh, George Washington himself chases down several British soldiers for miles before his, uh, his aides can grab his horse by the reins and bring him back to the main battle. And he's you know, he's even quoted as having saying, follow me, my man, it's a fine fox chases day or something I'm, that I'm paraphrasing similar to that. Uh, so that was the Marines were at the decisive moment at the decisive point in the Battle of Princeton. And that is uh, that is key ground and it is preserved and you can go out and walk on it today. Uh, that is a great little battlefield there at Princeton. Uh, one of the things I encourage people is, as much as we can is to get out to the, to the doesn't have to be a national battlefield. A lot of these uh, are state uh, parks and Revolutionary War battles were much smaller uh, in scope and scale than 
trying to walk Antietam or Gettysburg. You get out there and walk the battlefield in an hour. And Princeton is, is one of those much better than uh, Trenton uh, as far as preservation and being able to look at the ground and see what they saw. Yeah, they've done a fabulous job and there's, there's nothing better than actually being there at the time of year when the battle took place, feeling that cold, seeing your your breath of uh, smoke in front of you and, and seeing the reenactors on the field, uh, just remembering that rich history. Great job to everyone involved with that preservation. Yeah, Roger, Roger Williams and his crew up there do a fabulous job. Absolutely. All right. Well, this this question is from the uh, from the outreach education staff. So it's my folks. Uh, you provided some new insights into the conduct of Colonel Rawl and the Hessian security operations around Trenton uh, in the weeks leading up to the Christmas crossing and attack. What new primary sources did you discover in your research and what did you learn uh, that you didn't know before beginning uh, to dig into the, the battle? That's a great question. Uh, so some of the, the primary sources that I used were uh, first and foremost, uh, I actually wrote this book while assigned to NATO in Europe. I was stationed in Portugal. So there's a plethora of online sources today. And the one that I found extremely helpful was National Archives Online. Uh, they have digitalized all of uh, George Washington's papers. The University of Virginia had a hand in, in doing that. And uh, you can basically get any letter uh, that George Washington did, did a great job of preserving uh, to get that firsthand account of, of what actually occurred on the ground. Uh, another great reference for me from a, a naval perspective was the U.S. Navy in the, in the 60s and 70s published a seven, uh, uh, seven book series on naval documents of the American Revolution. And it's everything from ships rosters to resupplies to accounts of battles, all firsthand accounts uh, that are all consolidated in a nice, concise form. And then there are several other works out there, like uh, one book that I really enjoyed was uh, called The Spirit of 76 by uh, Kalmager and Morris. And it is a compilation of all primary sources. But what they do is uh, they bin them uh, based off of historical events throughout the American Revolution. So make it very easy for someone to quickly reference if you're interested in the Boston Massacre. You can look that up and it'll have several primary sources and accounts uh, from that particular time in history. So those are some of the sources. And, and to ask, answer the question of what did I learn? Um, I think the thing that I enjoyed really getting a grasp of, particularly being a, a Marine, is the conditions that Washington set in order to ensure that Trenton would be successful. Uh, because a lot of people just know the myth behind, you know, hitting the drunken Hessians after they partied all night in, in, uh, in Trenton. But that's not true. That's really not what happened. Uh, Johann Rall was drinking and, and went to a Christmas party, but his soldiers were on high alert wearing their combat gear and, uh, and really uh, were worn down because of Washington, what Washington had done to set the conditions. So there were really four things that Washington was looking for in order to finally seize the initiative back to the British after being defeated across Washington, uh, excuse me, across New York and across New Jersey. And first and foremost was he had to consolidate his forces. He started the Battle of Long Island with 19,000 troops. By the time he crossed the Delaware River into Pennsylvania on December 8th, the force that was with him had dwindled down to about 2,500. And he knew that uh, General Howe had about 10,000 across the river. So he wasn't strong enough to seize the initiative at this point. He called General Lee and General Gates and General Heath that who still had Continental forces up in New York to come down and consolidate with him in Pennsylvania. And he also called the Continental Congress for assistance. And that's when the Associators and the Continental Marines were able to join Washington outside of Trent. So point one, consolidate your forces and build your strength. Point two was to understand your enemy. 
So he was very good at intel collection and mobilizing his forces to do that. So he wanted to know what is the disposition, the composition, and the strength of the enemy in these 17 cantonments that Howe had spread and, and rightfully uh, isolated his forces uh, at these cantonment sites in order to allow them to forge uh, during the winter as he put them into winter quarters, and also supposedly to protect the loyalists in uh, East Jersey. But uh, the Continental Marines were part of the, the uh, intel collection patrols that were going on across the river into New Jersey. And uh, they gathered that intel through spies who captured uh, enemy uh, through just doing reconnaissance patrols and such like that. So that was second, know your enemy. Third was to wear down your and so as they were trying to buy time to be able to consolidate their forces, Washington was sending raiding parties across the river uh, to be able to attrite the enemy and to conduct raids on them, to keep them on edge, to never give them the opportunity to rest or refit. And the other thing that that did was it made them numb to these limited attacks so they started to become complacent. And when the big fight did come, Rawl actually uh, brushed it off as, oh, this is just another one of these limited raids. But he didn't know it was a whole Continental Army coming down on top. And then the final thing that he really needed to do was he needed his adversaries to make a mistake. And he even set the conditions for that because General Putnam, operating out of Philadelphia, had sent Major Griffin with 600 militiamen across the river down by Philadelphia. And what that did was it drew Don uh, Bondapa, who was uh, Rawls' higher headquarters, away with uh, a couple of thousand Hessian soldiers and basically drew them 18 miles away further down river towards uh, Philadelphia. What that did was it put Bondana far enough away during the attack on Trenton that he could not rapidly reinforce uh, Rawl, basically isolate Rawl even further. And once all those four conditions were in place, that's when Washington gave the order to execute the plan before those enlistments were gonna terminate in a few days. You know, it's, it's amazing what he was able to do how he was able to learn on the job and applying all of those things that we talk about in, you know, command and general staff colleges and war colleges and all of the things that we spend a career learning as, as professional military officers, he learned on the job and could actually be a, a, a brilliant case study if people would, uh, took him a little more seriously as, as a military commander. And I think it's one of the things I've grown to appreciate uh, as I've learned more about the Revolutionary War and, and, and read more, is that he truly was brilliant uh, in the way he applied uh, his forces, uh, limited objectives. He didn't win all the battles, but he, uh, he knew what he was about. Absolutely. And hard learned lessons, too, to your point. Uh, but just the grit, the determination, and the perseverance not to give up on the great cause that allowed that all to happen. So really deserves all the credit. Next up, um, Bryce Terry of the International Society. And he'd like to know a little bit about um, Colonel Charles Waterhouse and the, the awesome artwork that was used uh, on, on your cover and throughout the book. Yeah, so Charles Waterhouse is, uh, is a legend in the Marine Corps. Uh, so this gentleman, uh, as you stated, was a painter, an illustrator, and a sculptor. Uh, he was born in 1924 and enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1943, right in the midst of World War II. He fought as part of the 5th Marine Division and actually fought on uh, Iwo Jima when Joe Rosenthal took the iconic photo of the Marines raising the flag on Mount Suribachi, uh, Colonel Waterhouse was there. 
And so once the war was over, uh, he actually received, which is all the more incredible in my mind, he received some severe injuries uh, on Iwo Jima, which gave him a lot of nerve damage on his left arm and left hand. So how he became such a great painter, even with that disability, is an incredible story. Uh, in 1950, he graduated from the Newark School of Fine Arts and Industrial Art. And from there, he became an illustrator. And the favorite subject of his work was the United States Marine Corps. He produced over 500 different uh, pieces of art concerning Marines and actually deployed to Vietnam three times as a civilian uh, combat artist. He came back from uh, Vietnam and he was commissioned now as a major in the Marine Corps Reserve and was actually uh, put into service in 1971 in order to paint 14 paintings depicting the Marines in the American Revolution. And that's because we were getting ready to hit the bicentennial of the Continental uh, uh, Forces operating uh, as part of the, the great nation. And that picture, uh, that's on the, the cover of uh, Washington's Marines, as you stated, is a painting of waterhouses concerning the Battle of Princeton. Uh, he would actually go on and continue to do artwork. He was uh, finally commissioned uh, or promoted rather to Colonel in 1991, and he would pass away in 2013. But he continued to paint Marines uh, until his death. And is actually his final artwork was he did individual paintings of every Medal of Honor recipient, uh, which are on display at the Marine Corps, uh, National Museum of the Marine Corps in uh, Triangle in Quantico, Virginia. Incredible man that we owe a lot to. And actually, I, I've already gotten approval to use his artwork for the next book that I'm working on, and I can explain here in a little bit. All right. Oh, well, that's excellent. Um, yeah, it's, I, I was impressed with compositions. Uh, it, it's it, it gets you a, a good feeling, a good flow for or a feel for the fight. Yeah, he's got a unique style that really speaks to you. Mm -hmm. All right, next question from uh, Shane James, uh, also the International District. How was Brigadier General Caldwalder as a commander, and how well did he integrate the Marines into his organization? Did they fight as a unit or were the Marines used as an independent force? That's a good question. And uh, so just like we give Washington credit, I want to give Caldwalder some credit here, too. And that's because, uh, as you all know, who know your history from that time frame, Washington was not a fan of the militia uh, because they had not performed very well for him uh, all through the New York campaign and into uh, New Jersey. And so he was a little. Uh, pessimistic when the, the associators showed up from Philadelphia, and rightfully so. I mean, he he wrote a letter, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, to I believe it was to John Hancock, where he basically said, hey, if, if you're relying on the militia, you're relying on a broken staff. Uh, they come and go as they please. They eat all of your uh, provisions. Uh, they, you know, they, they don't adhere to the same rules and regulations as the Continental regulars do. Uh, so Caldwalder shows up uh, around the same time as Samuel Nicholas and the Marines, and they show up outside of Trenton uh, as Washington is crossing the first time during the retreat across New Jersey. And Washington was also very pessimistic towards Marines because of his experiences with his own Navy that he built. And, and recall that I said uh, you know, the, the Marines were soldier Marines at the time, and they did not perform very well in Washington's eyes. So he's got these two groups he's not sure what to do with. And he tells Caldwalder, hey, go talk to those Marines and find out whether they intend to operate out on the water or on the land. And then, by the way, you take them under your charge as well uh, as a separate battalion. So Caldwalder does that. Uh, he and Nicholas talk and uh, the Continental Marines would be employed as a separate battalion operating with the uh, under the command of John Caldwalder and the Associated Brigade. And they would work together all the way until uh, the Battle of Princeton is complete and they get up to Morristown, where I explained how at that point Henry Knox uh, asked to have the Marines assigned to him. 
And, and so Callwalder actually performed very well. And uh, to the point where Washington offered him a commission as a brigadier general in the regular forces in the Continental Army, more than once. Uh, but both times, Callwalder uh, politely uh, stated that he preferred to stick with his associators uh, in the local area and, uh, and uh, thanked Washington for his uh, recognition of the service of the associators, but he was more than happy to remain with them. I've been very impressed with some of the militia generals. Um, another one that uh, is, was quite impressive in his operations was uh, General Ewing of the uh, New Jersey militia. So there, there are some units that were very, very good, but uh, you're, you're quite correct. The majority of the militia were uh, were a pain in uh, General Washington's. Uh, fourth point of contact uh, most of the time. Um, but, you know, in all said and done, by the end of the, um, the end of the war, we certainly couldn't have done it without the militia. Absolutely not, no. All right, next question up is from, um, here's one of my Color Guard staff uh, officers, Jacob Vink, uh, who's also the president of the Indiana Society. Uh, Jacob wants to know, with the long and distinguished history of the Marine Corps, are there any practices or traditions that are still in place today that would be recognizable to the Marines of 1775? Yeah, I, th I think so. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we mentioned the versatility of the Marines. Uh, fighting on sea and land by design from the Congress, and then it, it transitioning to being uh, infantrymen, basically to being artillerymen uh, in the Army's time of need. So today, in fact, we train our young Marines to be flexible, adaptable problem solvers. You know, the way we say it to be quirk is to say we do windows. We do whatever the nation needs us to do. Uh, and that's true. And, and actually, I've done far more missions that I wasn't specifically trained to do uh, than those that I thought I was going to have to do. Uh, but that's OK, because uh, we train you to operate in the fog of war and during the chaos of battle and still overcome, uh, not to be um, diminished in your service in any way by uh, not having uh, been fully prepared for that challenge you are confronting. Hand in hand with that, I think, is the fact that today the, the Marine Corps is the nation's premier crisis response force. And you could argue that this is one of the first opportunities where Marines responded to a crisis. If the Continental Army did not build up under Washington to execute this mission, it's debatable whether Howe would have attacked across the Delaware River, defeated uh, what was left of the Continental Army, uh, potentially captured uh, the uh, the Continental Congress, who at this time had uh, withdrawn towards Baltimore and basically ended the American Revolution. So being, uh, and actually it was the 82nd Congress in the 50s that wrote into, into law, just like the original Continental Congress did, that the Marines would always be the most ready when the nation is least ready. And so even today, we continue to keep that mindset of being at the cutting edge of technology, being the first to fight, being able to go in there as a flexible, adaptable problem solver and take on any challenge or obstacle that you may be confronted with. And then the final thing I think is the fact, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier, is the importance that we place on our history and our traditions and the legacy of those who came before us. Uh, it is part of the ethos of the Marine Corps. Every Marine is a rifleman. Every Marine is a fighter. No matter what your military occupational specialty is, uh, you will at some point have to pick up the rifle and go head to head with the enemy. And it's that ethos and that mentality that has led to success in battle for 247 years. And that all started with the Continental Marines during the 10 crucial days. All right, very good. Uh, we're down to our last question. And this is, uh, this is an interesting question because there's um, your book is 1775 to 1777. 
Uh, the war went on for many more years. Um, and I think you probably, when folks read the book, they're going to they're gonna be left wanting. So the question is- In a is, good way, I might add. Yes, indeed. No, in, in a very good way. Are there any plans for a volume two that delves into more of the Marines' actions at sea and through the end of the war? And I'm particularly thinking about the Penobscot Bay uh, operation. Absolutely. So thanks for asking that question. And so- uh, one of my mentors is a gentleman named Dr. Charlie Niemeyer, and Charlie's a retired lieutenant colonel and used to be the director of the Marine Corps History Division. Charlie wrote a great book on the War of 1812 and uh, helped me in my process of becoming a published author. And when, uh, when I completed this project, he contacted me and asked if I would do a collaborative effort with him. So we are currently working on what you could think of as volume two, because it will pick up in marine operations from 1778 to 79, and two areas particularly. Uh, Charlie's going to focus his writing on uh, marine operations on the Mississippi River, all the way from the Ohio Valley down to New Orleans, and then I'm specifically writing on the Penobscot expedition that happened in 1779. And a lot of people don't understand this, but this was the worst defeat in U.S. Navy history all the way from the American Revolution to 164 years later at Pearl Harbor. We lost 42 ships in that expedition, and the land forces were defeated and expelled uh, from the Bagadouche Peninsula in Penobscot Bay. But the only shining light and success throughout that operation was when the Marines actually led aspects of that. Uh, they captured an island, they captured an enemy um, battery, and they uh, scaled up a 300-foot cliff and conducted a successful landing and established a foothold on the peninsula to oust the Marines, excuse me, oust the British soldiers who had occupied this location. Really, other interesting part of our history is the British were trying to create New Ireland in what is today modern-day Maine. We have New England, you have Nova Scotia, which translates to New Scotland, and then all the loyalists who were being forced out of the colonies, many of them went and settled down in Nova Scotia, but Nova Scotia couldn't support this huge influx of people. So the British, for two reasons, one, to create a home for these loyalists and what they were gonna deem as New Ireland, but also because that is a hotbed area for where many of the privateers who were having a detrimental impact on British forces were operating at them. So uh, the British uh, actually successfully conducted that operation, were able to stay there until the end of the war because of the failed Penobscot expedition. All right. Well, I got to say, I really uh, enjoyed the interview tonight. Uh, thank you for uh, sitting down with us and for... Uh, for fielding our questions. Uh, this is a fabulous book. I think all of our guys that uh, you have the opportunity to uh, read that, and I know several have already uh, confirmed to me that they've uh, gotten it on order or received it uh, and are starting into it. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's well well worth your time. And I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed our uh, our time tonight. Yeah, I absolutely do. And uh, I just want to, again, applaud the Sons of American Revolution for really helping to keep our important history alive, uh, more important today than ever. And it, it's what a great reminder. And as we approach the 250th anniversary of many of these events, hopefully that will revitalize people's love of our country and, and understand all the great uh, work and the sacrifices that our forefathers did and sisters, I would add. So thank you. God bless you all. And Semper Fidelis. All right. Thank you, sir.